Okay, this is a short example of using Keras on a MacBook Pro. Compiled TensorFlow 1.5 last night. This is the training task we have. So we have our known as molecular breast images. Uh, the first task isn't that most exciting from a clinical perspective, but the goal is to classify individual exams as to whether or not there's a breast implant. You can see in the example with the breast implant, there's a slight halo around the implant. And we'll, whereas in the woman without a breast implant, you do not see the halo. So I'm going to go ahead and start the training and then we'll walk back and look at the program. So run this. You can see it's going to use TensorFlow as the back end. It's loading some information about the data sets that we're training against. One of the things you'll notice is, or I've noticed oftentimes, despite what memory is available, so this is a Titan XP with 12 gigabytes, uh, not all of it is readily available. And so while TensorFlow tries, and Keras in particular, tries to utilize all that it can, you'll see that it will fail and try less and less memory until it gets to a point where it sticks. So somewhere, we're somewhere around 10 gigabytes of RAM. Models pretty complex, multiple layers, multiple pooling. Uh, take a little while to run, even with a GPU. So in terms of the program, it's relatively straightforward, importing some Keras objects to make it easier. Data has been coded from DICOM into a Python data objects, a, a pandas or a num, numpy data objects. And change the path. This gives some information. So this data has two components. So the way a molecular breast image is acquired, there's an upper and a lower gamma camera. So it's measuring and counting the amount of tracer that's being emitted. So it's the same woman, it's the same breast, but what the upper and lower camera sees are, are slightly different. So I'm going to use one of those cameras as a validation or external test data, although it's not quite statistically independent. To get it a more of an independent sample, I'm going to separate the upper camera data into two parts, a, a training and a test. And then the lower I'm going to take as a complete object. This testing right in here to see whether or not it's poor image quality. The radiologist that interpreted the images made some notes as to whether or not there was um, basically uh, the usability of the image. And so I'm excluding those that the radiologist marked as uh, poor image quality. Relatively straightforward, I put a few parameters here to look at ease of training more or less so I didn't have to change. It's not optimal because I think you know I'd like to vary the filter sizes maybe a little bit more over the training but right now I have it set aside to use two and for the purpose of this example uh, I have them both set for 10 pixels by 10 pixels. Three epochs is not quite enough to get anywhere it's just going to make this convert uh, uh, or complete a little faster. I have played with the real-time data augmentation right now. I've taken that out of the program, but it's something I'll add. And again, following the approach above, use some parameters to be set. Relatively straightforward um, approach to modeling. You can see I've commented out some of the pooling. I'm still trying to play and optimize some of the training. There's, there's a lot of choices to be made, and this is this is really more of a proof of concept right now. So go through here. Here are my dense layers, and I'm introducing some dropout. It's a two-category problem, but I'm still treating it as, as a categorical, uh, just, just for this. I'm using the Atom Optimizer, something I'm, I'm looking at changing down, down the road, but it's just to get me started. Uh, a couple things I've learned. You know, saving the model architecture after compiling seems to be a good thing. Um, optimizing model and then also saving the results after the fit so you can train 
This allows you to pick back up and add more epochs later if, if desired, and this would be a case where we'd be interested. And then these final commands just look at the model performance and the training data, the 20% or so that we held out from the uh, upper camera for external testing, and then the larger data set where we used the lower gamma camera. So at that point, we can switch back over here. You can see it's training. It's a little bit slower today. Um, my GPU is, if you can hear the sound, is, is humming right along. 12 million parameters, it does change depending on the filter size, obviously, but um, what we have is a little over 8,000 images, 492 were marked as poor image quality, and in there we have a significant imbalance. So in the overall upper camera data set, we have 216 uh, images with a breast implant. We can go through and uh, look, we have 8,304 that have acceptable image quality. And then in that, we, we lose uh, 14 uh, implants where the image quality was relatively poor. And then when we start splitting it, you can see that my data sets, it'd be nice to have a larger uh, data set size, but there's only 38 examples where there's an implant in the test data that was set aside from the upper camera. And then when we look at the lower camera, it, it does match um, back up there to the upper camera. So we have 292 implants to be detected. So that's it. Those are the final results. And as you can see that the upper and lower results look way too similar. And so the idea about using the two cameras for validation doesn't seem to be uh, quite tenable, but we'll adjust. This is proof of concept and we'll see where it goes from here. Thanks.